I grew up in St. Louis, so I, I remember you pitching for the Cardinals. So, okay, <laughs> the, those were the the good old days. Yeah, they sure were. I enjoyed myself very much playing with some uh, some great athletes over there, the Ken Boyers, the Stan Musials, uh, Ray Sadecki, Tim McCarver, Bill White, Bob Gibson. I had uh I was I've been pretty fortunate to end up playing uh with some great athletes and then uh from the trade playing with uh Ron Sando, Ernie Banks, Billy Williams, John Kess or uh, the shortstop. Yeah. Yeah, Don Kessinger and uh... Yeah. So I've been I've, I've been uh I think more fortunate than a lot of players have. I see you grew up in California. Were you uh, recruited by a lot of teams back then or scouted by a lot of teams? Uh, from my word, I was at the time there were 16 major league teams and I was uh, sought after by all 16 and then there was the Pacific Coast League and uh, to my knowledge, I was approached by our uh, looked at uh, by three Pacific Coast League teams, which I ended up signing with uh, with the Oakland Oaks. Pacific Coast League was pretty good. Uh, th- those of us who grew up in the Midwest, you know, we'd have to wait for the uh, weekly edition of the Sporting News to find out something about it. But that, you know, there's a league that uh, Joe DiMaggio came from once upon a time, too. Right. Well, my understanding that they were a better paying uh, league than the big leagues was at the time. <laughs> what was your first contract? How much was it for with the Oakland team? My first what? Your first contract with the Oakland Oaks. How much was it for? Uh, that was uh, there was no bonus. It was just a, a monthly salary, because in those days, if they signed you over two thousand dollars. They had to keep you on the on the on the team, and so, so I think uh, uh, I was not a you know I was sought after, but I wasn't really uh, approached by like some guys were very fortunate to get uh, a very good friend of mine, Joey Malfitano, signed with the Giants uh, right out of college and. Uh, Ended up with uh, 1954 uh, Giants uh, with the World Series uh, pennant and ring. Yeah. So, so you were in the Giants farm system, and back then they were all the way the other side of the world in New York rather than in San Francisco. Right. Were you looking forward to the possibility of playing on the New York Giants team that had Willie Mays and uh, people like well, Wes Westrum? Oh yeah, they had uh, Johnny Antonelli. They had uh, oh boy, they had they had some great ball players. But yeah, you know, I, I think it, every kid's dream is is to get the opportunity to play in the big leagues. Whether it takes a while, like it did in those days, it, you had to play at least seven, eight, nine years in the minor leagues before you were thought of uh, getting to the big leagues. And uh, I had played, uh, I signed right out of high school with the Oakland Oaks at 17. So I played six years of minor league baseball, three years with the Oaks, and three years in the Giant organization, which I was very fortunate to play with Willie McCovey in in Dallas, Texas, in the Texas League. Could you tell that Willie McCovey was going to be a great player even back then? Uh, Let me hear that again. Could you tell Willie McCovey was going to be a great player even when he was in the minors? He can hit. He had a little tough time running the bases, but boy, can he hit! <laughs> uh, yeah, there was uh, there was every aspect of him being up, and then it ends up I'm playing against him for uh, eight years. So, yeah, no, there there was uh, a lot then uh, in Double A ball that he was going to be a, a very good hitter. So did the, the heat of of Texas prepare you for the heat of St. Louis? Two different types of heat, dry versus uh, humid. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, spring training would uh, would take care of that, you know, in Florida with uh, humidity and heat. And but heat never bothered me. I know it bothers a lot of uh, ball players, but for some reason, it just never bothered me. In fact. There was two ball games, one in Houston, 
uh, before the Astrodome, and one in Cincinnati where I lost 12 pounds and, and completed <laughs> both ball games. Well, oh, that's that's a lot of water weight. Uh, I assume yeah. you repl- I assume you replenish that after the game. Well, yeah. In fact, uh, <laughs> the game in Houston, if a game in Houston with a split double hitter, and I perspired, and it was pretty superstitious. I perspired so much I had to change uniforms because you know they were all pretty much wool uniforms in yeah. those days. Yeah, that that was the era before polyester or anything cool came along, yeah. <laughs> and 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 that yeah. wool that wool just absorbed it. And I would assume that that uniform by the time the game's over is probably feeling like it weighs about a hundred pounds. Pounds, yeah. Well, the, the other good thing about that too, I was on on base twice. <laughs> so that really, uh, you know, that really made you perspire big time. Who were the leaders of those Cardinal teams when you joined them in 59? Was it Stan Musial's team or Bob Gibson, or there was no leaders? Uh, well, you know, I'm going to put it in this, uh, in this perspective. Stan Musial was really respected and everything, but never showed the authority, which I really thought was great, of being the team leader. I think his name just represented him being a team leader and he of himself as the ball player. Now, there have been on a couple of teams where, uh, or organizations where big name ball players thought they were the team leaders. But in Stan, Stan's uh, uh, stance, he did not show to be a, and he did a lot of talking to the young players and everything else to, uh, Make them be relaxed and uh, you know enjoy the game of baseball in the major leagues, and that's why I respected him so much. And Ernie Banks was kind of like that too. Ernie Banks was not a guy to go out and tell you, you know, do this and do that. He he was, I think his ability was to play the game, get base hits, and get on base. Your first manager with the Cardinals was uh, Sally Hemus. Yes. Uh, well. How did he differ from Johnny Keene? Uh, well, I've got to give Solly a lot of credit because they kept me. <laughs> you know, he kept me. Uh, and uh, I was probably because I made, we, uh, we took a tour to Japan in the winter of 58 when I got traded from the Giants to the Cardinals. We were in, uh, we, uh, we went to uh, Japan, Korea, the Philippines, uh, and uh, toured. So I had, uh, you know, I understood where he was and how he, how he acted and everything else. Uh, Johnny Keene, in due respect, was a longtime minor league uh, 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 manager in the Cardinal organization, and he was a little different. When he got to the big leagues, it, it was quite a bit different, I guess, for being so many years as a manager in the minor leagues. Well, and, and Sally Hemus was, I, I believe, a player manager also at some point in his career. Uh, most likely. I know that he was the, uh, as a player, but he never managed in the minor leagues, to my right. knowledge. The Cardinals was his first ma- uh, major league, our uh, first managing right. uh, team. Bill White said it was hard to play in St. Louis because, I mean, there was some racial tension for him back then. Well, yeah, I, I, I can, I can understand where Bill White's coming from. I had played. In fact, it was uh, pretty much throughout. I, I'm from California, born and raised. When I never went through what uh, I saw and, and uh, absorbed in uh, uh, Dallas, Florida, St. Louis. When we were in Dallas, uh, Willie Mc, we had Willie McCovey, Tony Taylor, and one other. We had a, a Latin American ball player. We went into Shreveport, Louisiana, and they could not play. At all? So I, I no, they got a three day vacation. So I experienced that before I got to St. Louis. And then in Florida, my first year with the Cardinals in Florida, 
uh, the ball players could not stay at the same hotel we stayed at in downtown St. Pete. So I believe at the time, Mr. Bush, the following year in in '60, went out to the uh, the coast and uh, took over a motel, and all the ball players stayed together there. But the black ball players in downtown St. Pete could not uh, reside at the same hotel. I will assume during your career in St. Louis, you made it to the Hill to sample some of the Italian cuisine. Well, I, I, I got there once. There was other Italian, yeah. <laughs> there was other Italian restaurants there that uh, I enjoyed, where I, I didn't have to, you know, travel travel that far, which wasn't all that far to go to the hill. But I I stayed around locally to, to the restaurants in uh, in town. How did that broadcast booth? How was it big enough for Harry Carey, Jack Buck, and uh, Joe Garagiola? Well, in my estimation, they they were three great uh, announcers. Because all three like to talk. Oh, yeah, yeah, they (laughs) sure did. (laughs) Yeah, uh, I'm not so much about, not so much, maybe Joe did not talk as much as uh, Harry did. Harry Harry went on for his whole, all the time. And Jack Buck was kind of a, he kind of laid back a little bit, but I guess, to stay up with Harry, he had to communicate quite a bit. And as far as, you know, I'm going, I'm just saying that Joe was the, like most announcers now that are ball players or, uh, you know, not the lead, the lead announcer. And Joe was just, uh, was in line, you know, as a third person. And he would always tell great stories and, and his wife would play the organ at uh, sportsman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess him and Yogi had some great stories. You know, they were both uh, raised uh, right. pretty close to the, uh, there in St. Louis. So, Yeah, and if you're a Cardinal fan, you, say, you really like Joe Garagiola, but couldn't they have taken Yogi Berra? He could, they could have found a spot for him behind home plate, I think. <laughs> yeah, as it, as it turned out to be, you know, what a, uh, I don't know defensively what kind of a catch it was, but boy, it was a, there's probably one of the worst strike hitters in the in the world. Yeah. You know, a ball over his head was a strike to him, and a ball bouncing in the dirt was a strike to him, swinging the bat. And I would think bad, pitching against a guy like Roberto Clemente, same thing. You you think you may be wasting a pitch, and the next next thing you know, he's on second base. Very tough hitter, because he stood deep in the box and. Had, you had a short fence in right field, so and when he stepped into it, yep, he he was just tough. You had a hopefully hope that you had a series where he wasn't hitting, and such as Willie Mays at a given time would have a series that he wouldn't hit that much. But everybody knows what type of hitter he was, and Roberto Clemente was kind of that. You know, I think uh, in respect was a, a a real tough out to get to. My gosh, he, uh, you can throw the ball four, six inches to a foot off the plate inside and some way, somehow, he would make a contact with the ball because he's still so far back in the batter's box. A lot of people don't realize that you won 21 games for the Cardinals in 60 and then 18 and 63. Were you the leader of the pitching staff in those, at that time or was it still Bob Gibson? Uh, well, Gibby, Gibby, uh, Came after uh, sixty series. He came uh, late in nineteen uh, uh, sixty. I think the the top pitcher for us in sixty was uh, Larry Jackson. Yeah, was our top pitcher. And then uh, I was very very fortunate for some reason I don't know of winning seven games in relief out of the twenty one games. That I won in 1960. Seven of those games were in relief. How did that happen? I mean, did you did the starter get shelled and just put you in, or no? They, uh, I don't, I don't know, know where where <laughs> it came from. They just that they had me being relieved. In fact, at one stretch, well, not stretch, but at one uh, incident, I pitched a double hitter on a Friday night in relief, won one and lost one. And uh, off Saturday, all of a sudden, came back and shut out the Dodgers Monday night on on a complete game. 
Who's which, the toughest? Who's the toughest batter he had to go against? Oh, uh, oh boy, Eddie Matthews was tough. Uh, Roberto Clemente, uh, Harvey Keen was uh, Harvey Keen was really tough. He spot you two strikes, and you had a one heck of a time to get him out. I just thank God he spent more time in the American League than he did in the <laughs> National League, because <laughs> he was tough. Uh, you know, there there's numerous about uh, players. Uh, uh, the Dodgers had a couple of the, the Davis uh, guys. Uh, yeah, uh, then there's a few other ones. Uh, yeah, that I mean, you know, Pete Rose was tough. Pete Rose that, was really tough. Yeah. Dodgers had a guy named Duke Snyder who who could hit that ball off of the uh, the pavilion oh, fence yeah. in right field. Yeah, well, I I kind of got him to, uh, towards the end of his career, so you know it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't that bad on me because okay. it was at the tail end of his career, but. Some of those other guys, boys, they, well, I think that it's, uh, the strike zone was different in those days, and uh, uh, the pitching was not emphasized to, to blow the ball by somebody. You had to, to uh, spot the ball, make sure your breaking balls were for strikes. As compared to now, that uh, it seems like everybody has to throw 95 to 100 and yeah. then go get an operation. Yeah. And and they didn't worry about pitch counts back then either. No. No, I pitched 12-inning game against the uh, Pirates in 1960. I was very fortunate to beat them four times when they won the World uh, Pennant and the World Series. <laughs> I, I uh, hooked up with uh, Vernon Law for 12 innings. And Stan Musial hit a home run to win it for me. Oh. Everybody talks about the great third baseman, Brooks Robinson, Ron Sano, Eddie Matthews, Hall of Famers, but a guy who's forgotten is Boyer from the Cardinals. He he should be in the Hall of Fame also if those guys are in. I totally agree. I, I totally agree with you because Ken Boyer, for his size, was one heck of a ball player. And there, the, the, when you go back to uh, – if. Dan Musa was a, a leader and everything. Ken Boyer was in the same category as Dan Musa. A great team guy, one of the most respected on the team, but did not, you know, did not be that uh, uh, that great on you doing this and you doing that. He just he just respected you as a as a major leaguer. And I, I, I really did not know that Ron Sandel had the stats that he had. I thought Kenny Boyer's stats were better. But then I read the, uh, the stats on Ron Sandel. That really blew my mind. Yeah, but, but if you compare the two, he and Boyer are not that, that far apart. And I always thought, you know, if Ken Boyer had played for the Cubs and if Sandel had played for the Cardinals, the people in Chicago would be saying Ken Boyer should be in the Hall of Fame and Santa yeah. would have been left out. Yeah, well, you know, the, you got to, in some respect, re, uh, go to the ballpark where Ken played baseball. That was a big ballpark. Yeah. Wrigley Field was a good ballpark when the wind blew in for pitchers. It was a heck of a ballpark for the when the wind blew out for hitters. And where St. Louis was was big ballpark for you know. A, a, Basically, a, a good pitcher's ballpark. A lot of people say Willie Mays was the greatest ever. Do you think that's true, or you think somebody else was? Oh boy, I tell you, I mean, I've got a lot of respect for him, but it's awfully hard to uh, put uh, him that much in front of uh, Roberto Clemente, because I I had a lot of respect for Roberto Clemente and Henry Aaron. Uh, is up in that category too. It, you know, Willie was more exciting. He made things look great. Henry just laid back, and Roberto Comini kind of laid back and just just played the game. Where Willie made you know stealing bases and everything else. Where Henry wasn't a great base stealer, but a great power hitter and a great base hitter. Roberto Clemente, great hitter, great fielder, great arm. But Willie was just a little more exciting than those two guys. Uh, another outfielder who was pretty good at, at just about everything uh, 
was your center fielder in St. Louis for Flood. Yes, yes. I would we think played against each other. I would we think it would be comforting to have him out. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, we played against each other in high school. Okay, he's from Oakland. he's from Oakland. Yeah. Yeah. But, he, he, you know, he, uh, for his size, I mean, range and a half in center field, go to right center, left center. He covered a lot of ground out there because, like I said, St. Louis was a big ballpark. And I think we had Joe Cunningham playing right. Uh, you know, he was first baseman, right fielder, where uh, Kurt had to do quite a bit of covering in the right center. And then I can't remember who was playing. I think Charlie James and uh, uh, the guy I got traded with uh, to Chicago uh, was playing left field. And Kurt did a lot of coverage in left center, too. So Everybody talks about the Brock for Burlio trade, but... What people don't realize is that you were hurt at the time. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, I've had people wonder how come nothing was said. Well, in those days, they didn't, you didn't go through the uh, programs that they go through now in trades. You, you just got, you got traded, you got traded. Nobody, the team that traded you, I, I would say the front office didn't know I was hurt, but maybe they did. But I did do know my trainer knew I was hurt. When that trade was made, though, just about everybody thought the Cubs got the best part of that deal because Lou, Lou Brock was not the player that he became. No, well, that's what the, that's what the Cardinal organization did for people. They made you they made you the ball player that you either became or was on the way up to become a, a, a good ball player. They just, there's something about that Cardinal organization that, that did that to you. I came from the Giant organization, and they didn't treat anything uh, like the Cardinal organization. Now, I, I'm speaking, I don't say the minor leagues, but I'm talking about the big leagues uh, set, uh, set. And when uh, Luke, I'm over there, I, I just think he felt comfortable and was probably talked to and was told, you know, hey, just go out and be yourself and do what you have to do. And by God, he did. He ended up hitting, what, 30-something home runs, stealing 90-something uh, bases and uh, hitting three-something. Well, when I went to – I didn't realize it at the time. But I had won three games. I thought I had only won one game, but I get I get information that I was three and zero when they traded me. Now that Cardinal team went on to go to the World Series. When you were still with them, did you think, okay, here's a team that's going to end up in the World Series and, and win it? No, they were they were we were in seventh place when the trade was made. Did you end up yeah, getting we, Did you end up getting a ring when they won the World Series that year? No, they, they wouldn't let you have uh, anything in those days. If you were traded within your league, if I was traded to the American League, I may have uh, I may have been voted a ring. But uh, uh, I was traded within the league, and being there was only eight teams, they didn't. Uh, I think baseball did not allow that. But I will get. I will say this, and I don't know if you ever heard of it. When I was home watching the World Series, and they win it. I got a phone call. The whole team was at Stan Musial's restaurant, and I talked to every ball player, and uh, which made me feel just fantastic because that shows what they thought about me as a as a pitcher. Did you get a check at least for contributing? No, no. Wow. Nothing. No, no. It's it's different now. So you get traded, and. Bob Kennedy is your manager. Well, we had a couple. I, I, I think Bob Kennedy was the manager at the time, and he was there for a short time. And then I forgot who else. You know, they had those roving coaches okay. coming in. Okay. Then they had Luke Klein, and then uh, Leo DeRocher in '66. What? What was? What was Leo like? Oh, I enjoyed playing for him. The meaner, the meaner they were, the better I played. <laughs> well, the, then you would have been a Hall of Famer if you played for DeRocher your yeah. career. 
Well, you know, I've, I just had the, I just had those problems that uh, it takes. You know, I after the arm operation in November of '64, I'm in spring training in February. Now you get a whole year off for that same operation. So basically, I it took me quite a while to get to, uh, to feel comfortable. And it just didn't work out that well, for, you know, with uh, with Leo. Leo wasn't a patient man. No, but I I'll tell you what, he there's people who would, that did not like to play for him, but I respect I respected the the way he treat as Ray he treated ball players uh, to some respect, and uh, the way I. I wish I could. Uh, I wish he would have jumped me more. I, in fact, I told him that uh, one day I saw him uh, down at Dodger Stadium. Uh, I was coming back uh, with some friends of mine. We stopped off at the Dodgers. Uh, I think it was their 25th anniversary, and uh, Leo was in the audience there. And uh, I told him, I said, "You know what? If you would have barked at me more, you would have gotten more out of me." He kind of looked strange at me, but I, 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 I respected him. Yeah. Well, there's the old saying, he treated everybody the, like crap. Yeah, well, yeah, but some guys going to take it and other guys couldn't. Yeah. I know he, uh, I, I can't remember our catcher that we had, but he had him so upset, he couldn't even throw a ball back to the pitcher. <laughs> uh, I can't think of his name, my God, but uh, I got a picture of his face and everything. I mean, he really had him upset. What player aggravated him the most? I'm guessing it had to be Sano. Aggravated him? Right. Well, no, he he basically, Leo basically made Ron Sano kind of the captain. Over Ernie? And, uh, over Ernie, oh yeah. Well, the, I would, you know, yeah. yeah, I would think Santa would be the. No, he was. He was. Uh, he was more or less uh, the captain because I don't think Ernie is that type of person to be uh, to talk. You know, to say things to about uh, the ball players. I think he 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 was just happy to be a ball you know, playing the major leagues, have the ability that he had. They go, you know, and play as long as he did from go to short, from shortstop to uh, first base. He he was just a happy-go-lucky guy. Could you have imagined Tim McCarver would have had the success he did as a broadcaster? No, I did not. No, I. But in fact, I didn't even think Bob Euchre would be a broadcaster. <laughs> but look what look what he ended up being. You know, I mean, a comedian, been on John, uh, Johnny Carson's show umpteen hundred times, and. Uh, uh, you know, and, uh, evidently uh, a heck of a, a baseball announcer. So do you see, get to see Lou Brock get together with him uh, from time to time? I have, uh, let's see, the last time I saw Lou was at his, I was invited back to his uh, 70th birthday party. And my son and I went back, I was 75. In fact, uh, they asked me to say a few words, so I got up to say a few words, and I told uh, I told the people in, uh, that were at the party, I said, you know what, I thought I had a, a, a big problem with uh, Johnny Keene, that's why I got traded, but it uh, turns out St. Louis went for youth, because I'm five years older than Lou. <laughs> So that's that's where I came from, but uh, no, he's uh, uh, that's the last time I was able to talk to him was that that was a few years ago. So I still think St. Louis will ever, forever will be Stan Musial's uh, team and not Albert Pujols because Musial it seemed like he just owned that city. Oh sure, I, I look at Albert Pujols, you know, great, great ball player and everything. You know, Bob Gibson spent spent his whole career there. Right. Is it Bob? You know, is it still recognized as Bob Gibson? No, it's Stan Musial. And Pujols probably would have been in the same category as Bob Gibson. Stan Musial did the, did what he did it did what he did for twenty something years. 
and was just a one heck of an individual, and that's why I think the Cardinals will always have the uh, Stan Musial behind the, their name instead of uh, the, some of the other great ball players that played. Uh, you know, like the Gas House Gang and that. Sure. Yeah. You were you were there for Stan the Man's last game. Yes. In '63. Yes. Uh, what was that like? Oh. Well, from my understanding, he went out the same way he opened up his major league career, one for three. And uh, that's how he ended his season, one for three. And, I mean, the place was just jammed with reporters and everything, but uh, uh, it was something that I will remember for forever because of him and because of the Cardinals that uh, – uh, I have a lot of respect for. Yeah, I just wish you could have stuck around for one more season and that the Cardinals could have made it into the World Series and then he could have gone out in in real style. But I, that wasn't meant to be. Yeah, wouldn't that have been great? I mean, uh, what, he spent 20-something years there and there yeah. was never on, a, uh, never on a World Series team. And he retires and then they went three more after that. Well, the Cardinals won some in the 40s. The, the 50s was a bad decade. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> but was he on the team in the Was he there oh, yeah. in the 40s? Oh, yeah. okay. He, he was teammates uh, with Shane Deanst and, uh, and all that. Yeah, they, oh, yeah, okay. So, okay. so they, were, they were pretty successful. They, they were open in the 30s, really good in the 40s. And when I was growing up in the 50s, there was nothing. He, he would, yeah. It's when they had, what, Enos Country Slaughter back in the 40s? Right, right, oh, right, yeah. right. I couldn't think of his name, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and Terry Moore and people like But right. in, the, in the 50s, of St. Louis, you'd look in the paper and that a Cardinal would be among the league leaders because the team wasn't going to be winning any pennants. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Bowley. It's a pleasure talking to you. Well, thank you for uh, calling, and I enjoyed it very much. I understand there was an article that came out in the Tribune there in Chicago. In yesterday's Tribune, uh, yes. Yesterday's uh, Tribune. Uh, like I, I said to the, the writer, I said, what sport do you know of that 50 years later they're still talking about a trade in, in, uh, in a professional sport? I said, there's never, there's no, no sport. They'll be 50 years after 50, a trade. Yeah, they'll be talking about it 50 years. <laughs> Bro, too. 50, 50 you years know, after a trade. So. Does it seem okay. that long ago? Huh? Does it seem that long ago? No. No, it doesn't. But uh, it's 50 years, and that still boggles my mind that, uh, that they remember a trade 50 years later. Like I said, there's no other sport professional sport that they can remember trades like that. Yeah. Not for that uh, length of time. No. no.